Hands of Fate 2 is a fascinating collaboration of a tabletop card game and a third person action game. It meshes the two genres together to create one of the more interesting interactive D&D video games I've ever seen. Although it came out last fall on PS4, Xbox One, and PC, the developers of the game sent me over a review copy of the new Switch version coming out this week, and I already had the PC version. Since I never actually reviewed it when it first came out, I thought we'd check it out and see if it's still worth picking up. Hands of Fate 2 has a unique setup for a story where instead of having one great big campaign for a D&D game, it actually has 22 different campaigns in the forms of challenges. Each of these campaigns are generated through the use of random cards that dictate the events and the pathways of the story. They're all set in the star fantasy world of Dungeons and Dragons. The stories that these campaigns tell aren't all that fascinating from a writing standpoint, instead they act as backdrops for the challenge that the campaigns bring up through the gameplay. Despite the writing not being so amazing, the experiences were pretty fun to go through. They were very much bite-sized D&D adventures with just yourself rather than an entire group, and it worked pretty well. With it being built from a mix of different game genres, Hands of Fate 2 is ultimately a card deck builder. Its main game mode, the campaign, is broken up into 22 challenges, each acting as its own little campaign. These campaigns are led by a mysterious figure known as the Dealer who builds up the D&D campaign on the tabletop as it unfolds before your very eyes. Before entering a campaign, you'll be asked to choose the deck you'd like to use. As you play out these challenges, you'll gain new cards that can then be used in your deck in new challenges in the future. These cards are split into three categories, Companion, Encounters, and Equipment. Companion cards are your partners in situations like combat. They can be very valuable assets or a support figure as you take on waves of enemies. Encounter cards create new situations in the D&D campaign like running into a pie salesman or being chased off a bridge by a horde of enemies. Lastly, there's equipment cards like weapons and shields that can give you an effective boost in battles. These are the cards that change up each of the campaigns from their core story. Each campaign is represented by a tarot card with a goal that varies with every campaign. It can be anything from saving some soldiers to guarding a helpless man across a dangerous pathway. These stories are pretty set in stone for the most part, well, the core base is. While one story may be set on having to save someone, what happens along the way all depends on the cards you pull. That was a constant trend in this game as a lot of it is now left up to chance, and while that can make each experience feel new at first, it can still grow repetitive over time, and at times, feel unfair and discouraging. You see, playing one of the later challenges in the campaign can at times take up to an hour or so. In total, the game can actually be beat in about 12 to 14 hours. When you're in a campaign, your goal is of course to survive everything while achieving that mission's objective, and it can certainly feel like the odds are against you at times. When it's done well, the campaigns are lengthy, giving you many opportunities to dodge attacks, gather resources like food and gold, and basically survive. However, it can feel pretty unfair when you have a solid deck of cards to begin with, and still manage to lose a challenge solely because you pulled a bad success rate or a bad dice roll in a situation leading to your death. Furthermore, it can be a bit discouraging to continuously replay these situations because you start from the very beginning of a challenge once you die. If you're an hour into a challenge at that point, you're most likely more annoyed than eager to get right back into it and have to replay everything. Now that's not me complaining that the game is too challenging or too hard, but rather that a lot of the success rate in these campaigns can often land on a simple dice roll and it can feel a bit unfair. With that said, these campaigns were still pretty fun to go through and although the repetitiveness did hit eventually, it only did hit towards the very end of the game. Pulling an encounter that has you fight an enemy throws you into a quite literal reenactment of the situation. In these sections, you get into a third person action shot that certainly feels better than the first game, but can still feel simple and stiff at times. These battles usually have you attack, block, and dodge in coordination to the movement of an enemy. It's not a super deep battle system, but it feels slightly more polished since the original Hands of Fate. This is also where your companions appear to help you out with their own unique abilities. Outside of the main campaign mode, you can play an endless mode that is quite literally as it sounds, a long form campaign made up of the cards you've collected. It's a great mode to jump into once you've beaten all the challenges and want to mix it up a bit. Hands of Fate 2 is a pretty okay looking game. It's one of those games where you can just tell it was made with the Unity engine without even checking if it actually was, so take that as you will. I thought that the scenes where you were inside the dealer's room playing the tabletop game looked really nice and atmospheric. It definitely wasn't the best looking models I've ever seen, but I think the way the scene is presented is captivating. 
In the battle sequences, on the other hand, I thought it looked really rough. The animations and fights can look stiff at times, making the game look generously less polished than the tabletop scenes. I played both the PC and the Switch versions of Hands of Fate 2, basically the lower and the high-end tech spectrums of the hardware. The biggest difference I noticed between the two versions was the resolution and the aliasing going on with the Nintendo Switch version. The Nintendo Switch version looks like it's running at 720p both in dock and handheld mode with a pretty solid 30 frames per second. It does dip on occasion, but nothing that's bad enough to ruin the game. When compared to something like the PC version, it's a completely solid port that takes a hit on resolution, aliasing, and less environmental effects to make this playable on the Switch. The grass has been toned down, the haze in the environment is turned off, and the shadows are pretty darn blurry. Hands of Fate 2 wasn't a particularly good looking game to begin with, but with that said, the Switch version didn't have to make a ton of sacrifices to get it to run either. of their people to the lazy, thoughtless, and malign. I have tried to anticipate the changes the usurper might make. The music in Hands of Fate 2 isn't anything outstanding. In the combat sections you get this heavy drum music that sounds like it belongs in the new God of War game, but certainly not as catchy. Let's just say that the music was good enough for the fights that were already pretty mediocre to begin with. Actually, I'd even say that the music was pretty parallel to my thoughts on the visuals in that I thought the tabletop sequences not only looked better, but sounded better. The eerie sounding effects in the background as a horse carriage pulls you along with you inside it. It sets the perfect mood for this dark fantasy world. Now, whoever did the voice for the dealer also killed it with their performance because hot damn that's one great voice. It was chilling to listen to and it basically is the old grandpa raspy storytelling voice that's just perfect for D&D games. It definitely made the campaigns a much better experience. On the Nintendo Switch version, I did notice some smart use of the HD rumble like moments where you had to roll some dice. Shaking the dice with the analog stick would actually rumble the Joy-Con around to feel like there were actually dice inside the Joy-Con. It was a clever way to make use of the new Switch feature with a constant game mechanic that was already implemented. Ultimately, Hands of Fate 2 is an amusing collaboration of tabletop card gaming and third-person action combat to create a fun D&D cross-deck building game. Presentation isn't the best in general, but at least not a lot had to be sacrificed for it to run on the Switch. That's not to say that the game isn't flawed though. A lot of the challenges can end up feeling unfair when things are left up to chance and the punishment is repeating the campaign from the very beginning. However, when the odds are in your favor or at least are more balanced, these campaigns despite being solo games can give you hours of entertainment as if you were playing a D&D game in the basement with your friends. In that sense, I thought that Hands of Fate 2 was a great game to get lost in for hours on end whether you're playing in front of a TV or on the go with your Nintendo Switch, at least when the odds are more balanced. Currently, Hands of Fate 2 goes for 30 bucks across all the major platforms including the new Nintendo Switch version, and if you're into D&D or tabletop gaming, I think this game is definitely worth checking out. If I had to give it a score, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. That does it for my review of Hands of Fate 2 for the PS4, Xbox One, PC, and Nintendo Switch. If you have any questions about the game, feel free to ask me in the comments down below. If you enjoyed the video, then please consider giving it a thumbs up. You can also click on my face to subscribe for more videos just like this, or you can check out one of my other videos on the left side of the screen. Thank you all very much for watching. The next video you'll probably see on this channel will be my Q&A while I'm in Japan, so look forward to that, and I'll see you all in the next one.